whether you'll use these or not, since I'm cracking the whip and making you turn up here. It's kind of might may defeat the object. I'm not not quite sure. But anyway, all right. So let's uh, start this. So um, we've talked about the mechanisms for uh, transport. They are advection and dispersion. We've talked about how dispersion occurs, uh, and it's due to two processes, right? It's due to molecular diffusion, which occurs when, which is significant if flow velocities are very small or zero, because then you see that as the major transport mechanism. But if flow velocities are large, then molecular diffusion gets completely swamped by mechanical mixing. And mechanical mixing just happens to look like diffusive process, and that's why we lump those two terms together, because when we talk about dispersivity, right, we talked about longitudinal dispersion, and it's these two individual portions that we look at. A longitudinal dispersion coefficient um, and uh, multiplied by some advective velocity, typically along the direction of, of, of flow. And we can do the same for transverse dispersion. So two mechanisms, advection and diffusion. If you look at dispersion slash diffusion, then there are two mechanisms embedded in that. One is molecular diffusion, very small, maybe 10 to the minus 9 meters squared a second. And another term, which we've already alluded to, is a function of the advective velocity. And also something that we've kind of said that um, isn't a material property at all, which is kind of intriguing. So we'll get to that later on today. So we know how to use those because we've developed the expressions on the board. We've talked about how we can use those to, calc to um, predict, for instance, what the magnitudes of dispersion would be. Um, so now the question is, how might we be able to measure those values, to know what those values are, so that, for instance, we know that this isn't a material property, but it's related to something else, or how would we measure the molecular diffusion in our particular coarse medium? And so you can imagine there are a variety of ways of doing that. You could do it in the laboratory, which is one way to do it. You could do it in the field in either of two ways. One is by using some kind of well test. So where you induce some flow. Um, and we can think of a couple of configurations for doing that. And perhaps the best one of all of these, not always at your um, disposal, is to do something that kind of replicates the flow gradients, the flow velocities that you have naturally in, in your aquifer. And so what we'll find out, perhaps, is that by far the best is this last one. And indeed, the other two might not be suitable whatsoever. That, that may well be the, the conclusion we're coming to. So talk about laboratory uh, approaches. I don't want to talk about this. Not going through all of these. You can fill this in yourself. So here's the idea. So actually, we've kind of couched the analysis that we did in these terms all the way through our discussion. And that was that if we want to look at an aquifer, then we can think of the aquifer as sitting uh, beneath the, the ground level. Looks like some spill in the upstream portion where we have concentration of C0 at the upstream boundary. And we look at the behavior at a compliance point where we just, um, we're just we removing water and we're measuring the concentration and how that concentration changes as a function of time. And so we can look at that either as a profile of the concentration along the sample or the aquifer, which we know how to do. Or we could look at it at the compliance point where we get the change in concentration uh, responding to time. For big Peclet numbers, inf infinite Peclet numbers, which physically mean since the Peclet number is equal to the ratio of advective velocity to dispersion, when uh, dispersion is zero, then the Peclet number is infinite. So that's the other way to think about this, right? As Lauren drew. And as uh, dispersion is increasing, it gets flatter because the Peclet number is reducing. So obviously, if you do an experiment in the lab, in a core, you can't see this. And so you can't use that. But you can use the external residence time distribution trace as it comes out of the sample to be able to do that. And of course, what you could do is you measure the relative concentration as it comes out as the end of the sample, 
You normalize it maybe relative to the maximum concentration that you get out of the sample, which should be the same maximum concentration that goes in. Uh, you record what those magnitudes would be as a function of time. So you take a measurement here, maybe it has zero concentration. Take a measurement here, maybe it has some concentration, and it ramps up to some magnitude. Of course, you wouldn't have this curve to be drawing on. You'd just be drawing a, uh, a series of points with time. But rather than drawing these points with time, I suppose what you'd want to do is draw them as a function of resonance time distribution. And so as you just so rightly said before, your time would just be modulated by your advective velocity, which hopefully you could measure. If you know what the Darcy velocity is and the porosity, you could certainly measure the advective velocity. And uh, conveniently, dispersion doesn't turn up in this term at all, so you don't need to know that a priori. And so this is the length of the core. This is the advective velocity that you induce in the core. This is the time at which you take your measurements. And if you plot it on that, you would get a curve. It would plot somewhere on one of these curves. And so from that curve, you'd end up with a value of D, um, yeah, you'd end up with a value of the appropriate Peclet number, right? Because we could make a whole series of these curves for every conceivable Peclet number that you might think of. And so you could see which what this fitted best to. And since you know the Peclet number is equal to the advective velocity, which you know the length of the uh, sample and the dispersion, longitudinal dispersion coefficient, you know this because it fits onto one of these particular curves. So in other words, this would be the Peclet number equals whatever. So you'd know this number. Um, you'd know the advective velocity because you're putting it through that late. You know the length of your sample. <laughs> And the only other term you have to, to calculate is dispersion. And so uh, you can do that just from the expressions that, that we've used already. Um, this happens to be a, a simpler form of this, written in terms of pore volumes, but you're, you're basically uh, using that, that behavior. So this is what we've, this u value down here is what we've called tr so, so far. And so that would be fine. And it turns out not to be fine. Um, and the reason it's not fine is because. Uh, a lot of the, well, certainly you'd get a value of dispersion in here. And of course, this value of dispersion would be a function of both of these uh, mixing processes, if you like, that we've talked about. Advective velocity and longitudinal dispersion. And so you have to deconvolve this some way. And this certainly would be of the order of a, a, a small number, order of 10 to the minus 9, meters squared a second, which is molecular diffusion rates for liquids in liquids. Um, and so if this number turned out to be a, ver a big number, maybe two or three or four orders of magnitude larger than this, then almost all of it would be due to this magnitude. And you could, of course, if you know the effective velocity, you could calculate the one remaining component. And so you could calculate what this dispersion coefficient was from that. It turns out to be, certainly you can do it, and uh, it turns out to be of questionable use because it, as we'll find out, the, val the value of this dispersion, dispersivity, if you like, is typically, um, I want to see, say, a, a proportional to it. Of course, the proportional to function is alpha, right? So we can't do that. So it's roughly equal to the length of the core sample divided by 10. And so this is what we alluded to and we'll get to later on, is that this is actually not really a, a physical property of the aquifer. It's much more related to the length of the sample. Uh, in other words, the length of this particular core. And so that's a curious observation. So it turns out that doing these kinds of experiments aren't very useful if you're talking about uh, mechanical dispersion. They're much better if you're talking about uh, Brownian motion or molecular diffusion but then the problem is that because this number is so small, um, if you're doing this for your senior thesis, you might not have enough time to do a test before you take a single measurement, right, if the, the length of the sample is too, too long. And you could, cal you could calculate, for instance, how long that would take uh, just based on this. Right? And so um, the, the problem in, in doing this experiment is that the numbers you get out of this aren't so, so useful. So I mention that just to, to make the point that 
doing experiments on cores in the laboratory might be useful for measuring diffusion, uh, but are not very useful for measuring dispersion because it's you don't get decent numbers out of it for the for the reasons we've mentioned. So the alternative to doing that is to do something else, and that is instead of doing things in the laboratory, it's to do uh, well well experiments. And they're partially better, but they're not much better. And for that reason, they're very rarely done. But let's just talk about two different ways that you could imagine to do experiments and talk about their, their drawbacks. The idea of this is a single well tracer test. You could imagine um, you take a well bore, you mix some sodium chloride in water, you pump it into the well and into the aquifer, it spreads laterally out from your aquifer for a certain distance, and then you stop pumping in. Maybe you leave it for some time, and then you start sucking it out. And so you suck it back into the well bore, and as you bring it back into the well bore, you measure what the concentration is that you're bringing back into the well bore. And you'd expect it to look like something. What would you expect it to look like? So if you look like time, I've never really thought about this, but if you look at time versus relative concentration, uh, you've pumped it in, and at this point here, you start pumping it out. Well, I guess you'd have some kind of concentration distribution in space looking like what? This, I suppose, right? This would be around the front somewhere, and, or the front might be the 50% mark on this relative concentration, C over C0. This is radius in this particular case. If you now start sucking this back into the well bore, then you see the stuff that's the highest concentration first, and so you'd start right up here. And then as time went on, you'd get some kind of constant, and then it would tail off to some magnitude. And so the idea is, if you know what the solution is for the relative concentration and how that changes um, with the pore volumes as you start removing it, you should be able to calculate exactly what the magnitude of the dispersion coefficient is in this is, because this expression has the value of that. And so we could explain how to do that, but I'm not going to. I'm not going to because it's not very useful, and no one ever does it. But it's a way that you could physically do it if you, if you needed it. And uh, again, the main limitation of doing that is that the dispersion, it won't measure diffusion, because you'd never be able to pump anything into a, a low permeability material uh, to be able to do a test if this was a clay, for instance. So it would only work in sandy aquifers or silty, sandy, gravelly aquifers. Um, and the magnitude of this dispersion coefficient you get is not really representative of the behavior because it's a function of the scale of the measurement that we've kind of alluded to. So this doesn't work for you either. So you could do a more sophisticated test. That now, um, you probably know from, if you remember from talking about your 452 class, if you ever talked about doing um, well tests in that, there are a variety of different uh, well tests you can do. So you can do a slug test, you take a single borehole, just like this past one, you push fluid into the well, you measure the rate at which it goes into the well, and you use that to calculate what the permeability is. Or you can upscale and you can do a, a full well test where you drill a well, you just keep on pumping out of that well, and you measure drawdown at some other location, the so-called um, Thys solution that you might have used. To, and I know you, people have used that in the past. And the idea is that if you want a representative value of the permeability of your aquifer and how much storage it has, so you can make some decisions about um, your... Um, I don't want to do that. I'm just shutting it off. Um, so that you can make some decisions about you know, your sustainable use of that aquifer if you're going to use it for agriculture or for the water supply of State College, then the idea that you have a pumping well and a monitoring well means that the volume you're affecting is much larger and therefore it's a much more representative test because you're sampling a much bigger part of your aquifer. And so you could think about doing that for a well test that instead of measuring the permeability of a system, attempts to measure the uh, transport properties contaminant transport properties of a, of a medium. So you can imagine putting in a well here, so you're looking in plan view, an injection well here, a withdrawal well here, you inject water that happens to have, well, it could just be water for that matter, right? Just straight water. And you can imagine that the flow field you get from this is this 
potential flow field that you know we talked about fluid kinematics in phi 303 and you'd calculate what these are uh, you could surmise that you could get a solution for this doesn't really matter what the solution is but you could surmise that the residence time from a particle of water going from this point to this point the fastest way is the kind of as the crow flies direction the gradients will be fastest along this flow path and also it's the shortest flow path and as you go further out the slower flow paths will be these progressive ones this one will be slower than the inside one this one will be even slower and of course the slowest one is this one here which goes off to infinity to your left and then magically comes in from infinity to your right to the well so that's infinitely long and so if for instance you then instead of just pumping water through this you put some salt solution in it and you looked at how quickly that salt solution arrives at the recovery well well if it gets carried by the effective velocity uh, on this streamline it will arrive first from this this well here from this streamline and as you go progressively on each of these other flow paths then it will arrive progressively later so if you think about a stream 2 which is between these two um, arrows in other words in this one here you could look at the progress of the front as it worked its way along here and all of a sudden it would arrive at the well bore and at the time it arrived at the well bore the concentration would start going up from zero when it hadn't reached there to some small value once it just got there if you look at the flow along the next kind of flow stream tube as you get here uh, it would take longer and so this one's already arriving the next one's just begun to arrive and will keep on arriving and so it goes up and the concentration increases so as you start uh, adding more and more of these uh, well tubes that actually arrive at the recovery well then you start stepping up this and if you keep on going you can imagine that finally you'd reach some steady concentration that would represent uh, the behavior here. And so you could imagine that you could use this curve. So this curve here, you know, this is, this is for the constant injection of fluid at some concentration. So in other words, the top one of those uh, diagrams on the left side of the board, the heavy function term, in other words, the input function on this left-hand side with time looks like this. C over C0. And if you look at the output function, it would look like this, which is similar to one of the uh, curves on the thing that we drew. If the input function was this spike function that looked like this, whoops, should be just vertical, again, C over C0 and time, then the arrival response would reach some peak. And then because it's all worked its way through from the upstream well to this point here, it would start falling off. So you'd expect to see some distribution for this continuous injection case, plus the one where you just spike the fluid initially with a bit of ink, and then, you, and then after that's pumped through, you just keep on at pumping water through instead of ink, and you'd end up with this. So what's the problem with this for an experiment? Why would that not work very well for if you wanted to measure dispersion? Well, the principal reason is that if you think about what we just said, how we do this, this is kind of looking at plug flow, right? The plug flow goes along this uh, stream tube. It gets progressively further. There's actually no dispersion um, attached to this in our kind of thought of it, but it arrives here, and then it arrives at some low concentration. And it's only after this one has arrived that the next one will arrive and do, and do this. And so if you think about it, Basically, there's some natural dispersion in the system, not because it's flowing in this porous medium and, and mixing and spreading, but because it's arriving fastest in this stream tube and slowest in this other stream tube and even slower in this other stream tube. And so if you think about it, it's kind of like the case, if you look at what we think of as our idea of dispersion, is that this you have this front going through here with these fingers attached to it. And this is C0 back here, and this is concentration equals zero ahead of this, is that these, are, of course, are flowing along fast paths, and they arrive early, 
and they do something to, to this behavior. But this hasn't happened because of anything to do about the natural process of this occurring in the aquifer. It's happened purely as a function of the geometry of the flow regime. And so you'd imagine that if you use this to try and calculate the dispersion, there's this huge effect of the uh, dispersion just of the geometry of the flow regime. And then on top of this, there'd be this mixing due to this hydrodynamic mixing, which you'd have to pick out from this other big signal. And so the issue is this signal completely overwhelms any dispersion that you'd see due to um, mixing in the aquifer, and therefore it doesn't work. And so for that reason, you know, when we come back to these discussions about how we might want to measure these, laboratory methods work OK for molecular diffusion type things. Well testing, either single or dual well testing, doesn't work very well for these because the scales are too long and you have to wait forever to see it. And they also don't work for values of this dispersion coefficient. And so typically, they're not used for that. And so where does that leave us? How do we do it? How do we get magnitudes for these uh, in some cogent way to be able to design the projects that we'd like to be able to look at? And so one way to do it is by a so-called natural gradient uh, tracer tests. And so the idea here is that you do an experiment or you measure an existing plume. And if you know, for instance, when that plume originated, you certainly do if you run an experiment to do it, uh, if you put it in the ground yourself, um, then you can do something, hopefully, to be able to figure out exactly what the dispersion coefficients are. And so here's uh, the idea. This is also taken out of your textbook, out of Fetter. It's from an experiment that was done in Borden in uh, a couple of hours north of Toronto at a, a Canadian Air Force base, as it turns out, uh, which is a sandy aquifer. And what was done was that a plug of tracer was put into the very shallow aquifer, maybe a meter, two meter, less than two meters, yeah, a meter below the, the ground surface. The water table is quite sh uh, shallow. And surprisingly, now, this isn't such an easy thing to, to get, obviously, that you have this picture of where this plume has gone from when it was initiated at one day to where it was after, I think that says 85 days, to where it was after four, a year and a third, to where it was at almost uh, two years. And so this is exactly the behavior that we've seen if we look at, for instance, what we said we thought would happen if you put tracer in the ground, in that it would move from an injection point here to downwind of this, to downstream, to further downstream at successive uh, locations. And so what we could do, since we know that the dispersion of this plume is a function of this uh, three standard deviations of the, um, the Gaussian distribution, if we can find the edge of the plume and we can measure exactly what this length is, we have a chance of being able to figure out exactly what the dispersion is. And we hope that because it's being driven by the natural gradient which sits in situ anyway, that if we measure this and we know when we look at the, what the plume looks like, then we can pull this value out of it just by solving this equation. And that's really all it is. And so what we can do for these particular cases is we can use that. And that's all this um, <clears throat> tabulation to the left is. We need to know, what is it we need to know? We need, what was it, that um, three standard deviations <laughs> was equal to the square root of, I guess I have it here since I didn't write it down. Is it on this page somewhere? Yeah, it is. Three standard deviations is equal to three times uh, the square root of 2 times the dispersion times time. And so if we, if we measure these values, so if we measure this length, it's easiest to measure on this one here, for instance, but you can do it on all of them. This length here, after 647 days, if you can see that, is of the order of 61 meters. Uh, no, sorry, this is how far it's, it's, uh, it's, it's traveled. And... Um, Oh. Oh. 
Well, that's... Oh, no, okay, yeah, 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 okay. So the other thing we'll need to know is the advective velocity. The length of this, I guess, after three, 647 days is 15 meters. So this length here is, is 15 meters. So this is 10 meters, this is 15 meters, so that sounds about right. Maybe it looks less than that, but it doesn't matter. So if you know what the magnitude of this length is, you know that it took 647 days to get that big. It started off very small, but by 647 days, then you can just use this expression here to be able to figure out what the value of this dispersion coefficient is, and you evaluate this magnitude. So you get a magnitude, in this case, of dl. This is our dl value, d sub l, longitudinal dispersion. The other way that we classified um, dispersion coefficients are due to this other expression, you'll remember, right? Is just molecular diffusion or molecular, yeah, spreading by molecular diffusion plus the advective velocity, or at least the absolute value of it, times the longitudinal dispersivity, I think it's referred to. This is in units of <coughs> meters squared over time. Could be days, typically as seconds, but in this particular case, uh, since these are in days, it's, uh, it's perhaps easier to do. And so if we assume that, well, what value do we have for this? So this is of the order of 0 0.02 meters squared per day. Uh, what order of magnitude is that if we look in terms of meters squared per second? Hello. Question. Oh, that's fine. Right. Too, too much information. Too much information. What's, what's the value of the... Um, uh, dispersion coefficient in meters squared per second. Good time to leave. <laughs> Did I see something there? <laughs> I wasn't sure about that. I caught something in it. I was always interested to see how this one picture of my kids, my daughter standing there like this when we made them actually uh, have a picture taken. So, so. I could, she's your age, so a year older perhaps. Where were we? Oh, are we recording this? Oh, thank good God we're not on camera. So, um, <laughs> for, for many reasons. Um, so, what we'd like to, so, the, the, the point is that we've got a value for this. We'd like to deconvolve it from these two different parameters, which we don't know. The only way we can, for instance, exclude this is if our value for dl, dispersion, is very much bigger than the value we expect for this, which might be, we said is of the order of 10 to the minus 9 meters squared per second. So the question is, if this is in 0 0.02 meters squared per day, so it's 2 times 10 to the minus 2 meters squared per day, what is that in meters squared per second? Is it big or small relative to this? And so how many, how many seconds in a day? <coughs> 86,000 something something. So it's 10 to the minus 5. So good number to know. So it's two orders of magnitude. Uh, this is two orders of magnitude larger than this, right, roughly. And so the main contributing factor of this, so basically this is 0 in our calculations. Great. So now we have one number which relates to another number. If we know the value of the effective velocity, we have a, a chance of being able to calculate the longitudinal dispersion, dispersivity. And so that was this calculation here. It's gone 61 meters downrange in 647 days. What's the velocity? Well, it's 61 meters divided by 407, 400 and 647 days, or for these different ones, it's of the order of 0 0.09 meters per day. And so now that we know this, <coughs> and we know this, 
then we can calculate the value of this longitudinal dispersion. And if we do that, we end up with some number, which I don't report here, uh, but you could do the calculation. So we could find out what it is. Of course, the other thing you can do is you can also measure this behavior um, transversely, right? And so the, the two aspects of this would be kind of the, the longitudinal length, which is what we call 3 sigma x, and the transverse length, which we're going to call 3 sigma y. And you can do the same calculation with these other, other widths. And if you use that, you can calculate what the transverse dispersion is. And you see that these values are different from each other. Uh, we said before that maybe they're a factor of three different. This is always smaller than these. And that is of the order of magnitude, right? Sort of that. This, well, not, not in this case, right? Because this is actually roughly equiaxed. But as you go down gradient, then the ratio of this to this, what's that? 4 into 23, that's about a sixth, right? Um, 4 into 19 is also about a factor of 4 or 5 or, or whatever. So they're different by that amount. And so that's why uh, when you see these plumes developing like this, they're elongate in one direction uh, because dispersion is larger in the longitudinal uh, direction. Okay? All right. And so that is our preferred method of being able to do this, either for uh, purpose-built experiments, which are rare, or by looking at our plume in situ and uh, estimating from that. Of course, actually, these are really unusual measurements. Why, why, you know, why do I say that? Any thought why I say that these are... Is it normal to, to know what a plume looks like at that level? It's not usual to have that much information or data. And so the reason is that these experiments were done in a, in a very shallow aquifer. It was done in a sand aquifer. And basically, these concentrations were measured by just taking capillary tubes, so maybe a tenth of an inch diameter stainless steel tubes, physically pushing them into the ground, and then just sucking water out in them, and then measuring the concentration of the water that's pulled out of them. And so that's very easy to do if you kind of roughly know where you are. If you know what the advective velocity is in terms of its direction, then you know that the plume is headed off in this way, and you just have to, and if you know what the hydraulic gradient is, and you know what the hydraulic, the permeability is, and you know what the porosity is, you can make the first estimate of where you should at least, at least start looking after 83 days or after 462 days, right? It's just going to be, this length is going to be equal to what? Um, advective velocity times time, I think, right? Just as you've done to get some idea of exactly where you should start looking. And then once you found it, then you just work out from there to, to cover the field. Okay. All right. So we've made the point that in aquifers where there's relatively high flow velocities, um, there's going to be this uh, dispersivity term. And this is going to be still there, but completely swamped in aquifers which have very slow velocity, like clays and shales, then this term, even though it's small, will be significant because this term might be zero. And so it may be the dominant feature. We made the point before that maybe this actually isn't a material property whatsoever. And so do we have any data to support that? Well, we may do, right? We've measured this. We've tried to get the value of this dispersion coefficient for three different magnitudes, uh, for three different times, rather. We know the advective velocity is probably staying the same for each of these. Well, is it? I guess we can check that. Well, roughly. Uh, from 9 to 11, from 8 to 11, right? So it changes by maybe 20%. But the magnitudes of these dispersivities are changing, well, actually they're not too bad, right? So that they're changing from a low of 0 0.016 to a high of 0 0.023. They don't show a trend in that this isn't the, uh, one isn't, I mean, this intermediate one is the largest one, uh, rather than, and the, the earliest and the latest ones are the smallest, so there's no real trend in there. Um, with knowing, we might expect this to be 
a larger value, and for reasons that we'll talk about now. But so we've made the point that this is not necessarily a, a property which is a function of the aqua. Actually, this, these data are kind of non-conclusive, right? They are kind of similar to each other in the range of, of values that we're typically talking about in this class. We've said that permeabilities vary by you know, six orders or ten decades, ten orders of magnitude, uh, but these are actually quite close to each other. What do we think is going on in these systems? Well, we've alluded to it before. And what we've alluded to is the fact that individually within the pore structure, uh, we might have uh, flow velocities uh, occurring between grains where it's slow at the edges, at the pore throat edges, large in the middle. And so you'd expect this to give a high velocity in the middle, which should carry stuff downstream quickly, and less velocity at the edges, which would kind of leave it not traveling very far, and there'd be some spreading that would occur with this. If you take that and kind of think about the connected high velocity pathways that you might have in this, maybe a lens of uh, material with a higher porosity or larger grain sizes, then you'd expect that the uh, stuff that's being carried by the water would travel faster in this zone than it would around it, and therefore would result in spreading as a, as a function. And that's exactly what happens. And so the mechanic, mechanics of dispersion is responding really to the fact that you have this heterogeneity within a system which allows some areas to travel faster than others, and as a result you get some spreading occurring as a result of that. And so you get some very interesting behaviors if you look at, for instance, looking at a whole bunch of, of observations from natural gradient observations. And so this is exactly what we've talked about doing today. So we've just gone through the case of trying to figure out exactly what dispersion coefficient should be for this Borden site. And we calculated the value of this longitudinal dispersion out of it. If you did that for a whole bunch of other sites, whether either natural contamination or human-induced contamination doesn't particularly matter, and you plotted up the magnitudes of, say, the length of the plume in meters, in this particular case, and you plotted up the, the magnitude of the dispers dispersivity you got from this. So this is dl is equal to molecular diffusion plus the, the velocity which you have in your particular um, aquifer times this thing that you perhaps think is kind of a material property, right? In a given aquifer, it would have a value. And if you went anywhere in that aquifer, it would have the same value. But what turns out, if you calculate this magnitude of this long dis longitudinal disperse dispersivity, which has units of meters, right? Because this has units of meters per second. And so together, they have units of meters squared per second, right? The product of these two. If you calculate this magnitude and plot it versus the scale, how big the plume is, you end up with this scatter plot. Uh, it's almost like uh, sh shooting a shotgun at a barn door to some respects. There's lot of, lots of variability, but you can draw an upper bound on it. And you could draw a lower bound on it. And you could draw a line that goes somewhere through the middle of it. And this line that goes somewhere through the middle of it is roughly um, plume length divided by 10. And so that's interesting, right? It says that it has no, it, well, it might have some correlation with the aquifer, but it has more of a correlation maybe with the length of the, the plume that you find. And so why would that be? What would be a rational re reason if you thought that was the case? What would make sense? So it's talking to the fact that it doesn't care about the material that's in the aquifer particularly. Um, but I suppose it's saying that some characteristic of all aquifers are the same and those properties vary with scale. So what do you think? No thoughts? No thoughts whatsoever? Okay. Well, I think one way you can interpret it 
is that if you think about this stuff flowing downstream, yeah. plume starts off small, it sees some little pieces of heterogeneity, and you, know, you find out these little fast pathways, but maybe they're just small um, features. So maybe you're, you're sitting in your aquifer, and you're at this upstream location, and maybe you have some little features like this, which act as little fingers, which allow this to actually speed down here. But now as you go further out from here and the plume grows, maybe you have in your aquifer the chance of you being able to hit a much bigger feature, like a fault, which is much bigger and has a much bigger permeability contrast, all of a sudden it's much higher because you're sampling a much bigger pa pa patch of your aquifer. And as you go even outside that, then the chance of hitting a really big open fault is perhaps even larger. And so the idea is, is that as, as this, um, the size that you sample in your aquifer increases from some um, very small magnitude, maybe a meter in size, it only has a chance to sample some of the small-scale heterogeneity and not really big distributions or differences in permeability. When it gets to 10 meters or 100 meters, all of a sudden the chance of it hitting a big feature is much higher. Uh, the chance of that being a really high permeability compared to the kind of average permeability of the system is also much higher. And therefore, the spreading that you get for it going on that fast pathway is much larger as well. And so that's kind of the interesting feature that comes from that. And that's the reason for it. So quite straightforward, uh, but also quite surprising because this says that it doesn't matter whether it's a, a sandstone, a gravel, a silt, a fractured sandstone, that within the realm of this distribution, it doesn't care what the material is at all. It just cares how big the plume is. And of course, you have to take that with a pinch of salt because, of course, if you have a plume that's 100 meters uh, in uh, length, then the magnitudes of dispersion aren't just the value of this parameter here, but it could be uh, two orders of magnitude larger, or it could be one order of ma magnitude smaller. And so this span here is three orders of magnitude. So, so this is a reasonable approximation, but maybe not always good enough, right? Depending on how, how well you need to know exactly what the magnitude of that dispersion coefficient is. Okay. All right. So I don't want to stop there. You'll be unhappy to hear. But I will take a two-second break because I might split the movie down the middle. Uh, so, I'm to come back to this. so we kind of talked about couldn't have a transport. We talked about uh, mechanisms of transport, convection and dispersion. We talked about two mechanisms of mixing, which are mechanical dispersion and Brownian motion, molecular dispersion. We talked about how to get magnitudes of uh, spreading for different flow geometries, either plug flow down core, spike flow down core, and also this kind of three-dimensional case. And we talked about how both the values of uh, molecular diffusion and dispersion can be pulled out really only by two methods, right? Mechanical mixing from natural gradient experiments, but we can also use this correlation that we just talked about to do it and from molecular diffusion with the added effect of the tortuosity of the pore space, maybe we can get that in uh, measurements uh, in the lab, uh, and maybe not. So we know something about it. And so we know how to be able to make predictions on, for instance, what these um, plumes might look like as they evolve and we look at some kind of compliance point. So we know how to do that. Um, so. The next question is, is whether the kinds of behaviors that we've looked at so far in terms of the different solutes is truly representative of all kinds of um, the kinds of solutes that we'll find in reality. And so the data for the Borden experiment were actually what would be refined, referred to as a, a conserved trace. So it's actually as uh, either sodium chloride or, or bromide tracer. And it would be what is referred to as conservative because it is inert with respect to the aquifer. 
And so there are two kinds of tracers or, or contaminants that you can think of in terms of broad de um, demarcations, and those are referred to as reactive or inert. That's one terminology. But a more usual terminology, the one we'll use in this class, which corresponds to that, would be um, non-conservative and conservative. And it's conservative in that it means that, not in a political sense, obviously, but in, uh, well, yeah, actually, what does conservative mean? That's a good, good enough question. What does conservative, what, what would you think a conservative tracer would mean? If you talked about it in 452 at all, maybe, maybe not. I think it might be beyond that. Don't know. Go ahead. Yeah. Just conservative, but not react. Or conservative, but not react. Not react. Yeah. So why do we call it conservative? Safe. Yeah, it could be safe, but not not, uh, not always. Um, if you drink enough salt water, uh, it won't be very good for you. Right. Yeah. So. What's, what's the expression? Water all around us, but not a drop to drink. So I don't know who said that, but that's for people in lifeboats. Lots of water available, but drinking water not. So yeah, so if you drink enough salt water, it's not so good. Conservative. What is what is conserved? Like whatever yeah. you inject as a tracer, you get back. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So never, whatever you have, it's always conserved in the liquid phase, not on the solid. So it's not taken out on the solid. So that's the basic... <coughs> Uh, description of it. And so conservative tracers are conserved, they're not sorbed onto the surrounding material, don't react with it, and therefore if you put a kilogram into a porous medium, there'll be a kilogram in solution there in a day time, a year's time, 10 years time, etc. It's not the case if it's uh, non-conservative. And so what we can do is we can define these behaviors in terms of retardation and attenuation. And so uh, what we can do is we can use the analysis that we've talked about so far to be able to understand behaviors when uh, the solutes aren't conserved. And so these apply to a bunch of different situations. Uh, the one that we'll really talk about, they could be reactions uh, between the media you have uh, with the, the solute that you have dissolved in water and the solid media. There could be reactions with other components in solution. Um, it could be things like acid mine drainage where it uh, comes from pyrite, iron disulfide, and reacts with limestone or not and gets iron boy precipitates. Um, could be a whole bunch of different mechanisms going on. But the one that we'll restrict ourselves to this to in this class which can also be used to apply to these other systems, is the idea of adsorption. So in other words, it satisfies what we want to be able to do, and that is the fact that if you put a kilogram of this in the porous medium that you have, if some of it gets removed either by reaction with the solid, reaction with other components in the fluid phase, or by being sorbed onto the solid, the net result is the same, and that is that no longer is there a kilogram of it there anymore, there's only 0.900 grams of it because the rest of it has gone somewhere else. And if we accommodate that behavior, then we can then use the same kind of tools that we've developed so far to be able to, for instance, be able to figure out exactly what our end result is this. We want to be able to figure out exactly what the behavior will be in our system if we have, instead of a conservative solute, we have a non-conservative solute. And so this expression that we developed already is only for conservative solutes. And so what we might want to do is be able to figure out exactly how we deal with the case uh, for sorption. And so what we can do is we can look at the ideas um, and maybe uh, I'll take this. So what's the so you've seen isotherms, right, in your current life and pre previous life. And so this is, I guess this is 4.1, right? 
And so uh, what we're going to restrict ourselves to, is, I guess, is sorption. So how do you measure absorption isotherm? How do you do that in the systems that we're dealing with? Have you done that in any of your class? Do you do that in your for the environmental systems engineers? Do you ever do that in your the lab classes that Mike Mark Klima runs in, in Thaddeus's class? Sorry, sorry. Both or just one? Both. Both. Okay. So, and how do they differ? Excellent. Well, adsorption is sort of just the one on the surface. Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. You might get out early today, but uh, oh no, well, I don't think so. We're not going to get that. So, yeah, it's got a bit of humor. So, so how do you measure? So, physically, what what does Source. I mean, how do you how do you measure? How do you measure? Isotherms. Yeah, isotherms. You know, have a physical feeling for what it is. So I, I mean, I the way I think about it is, you take a beaker, and maybe that's a beaker of sand, and that's fine. So you've got some um, massive solid in there. And then all of a sudden you put a liquid in there, which perhaps is water, just straight water. And that's fine. There's nothing to absorb. And then you take that water, maybe you take it out, and then you add water that has a concentration. Uh, what, what's the terminology that I'll end up using? Just so I use the same terminology that I use here. So you take uh, and you add water plus some kind of concentration, uh, lowercase c, uh, in the water. And you add this in here, and you measure then the concentration. So this is the concentration that's outside. This is the concentration that's inside. I know you're hoping that I come with some brilliant equation, but I'm not. Uh, all I'm going to suggest is that the concentration what you measure inside if it sorbs, it has to be less, right? Because part of it's been taken out of the liquid and it's been put on the solid, and therefore there's less mass in the liquid uh, than there was, and therefore the concentration has gone down. So the concentration once it's in here is less than the concentration before you put it in here. And the reason is that some of that material has gone onto the solid, which is increased from zero as this has decreased from the magnitude that it was when it went in. And so what you could do very simplistically but actually perfectly adequately for this explanation that we have here and again let me just see that I have the axes drawn in the same way just so there's yeah, C star. And so you plot the concentration on the solid versus the concentration in the water. Initial concentration, so I guess it would be what we call C out, for not a very good term. And so if you have a concentration in the um, fluid that you put in here, you put it in and you measure concentration in the solid and you get a single data point. This is the first value of C star you measure and this is C out. You don't care about this value, you just care what you put in. Then maybe you go to, uh, you double this concentration. If you double this concentration, you go to this point here, you measure the concentration in the uh, pore fluid. If you know the concentration of the pore fluid, you, bless you, you know how much has been taken out onto the solid, because those are the only two um, reservoirs, if you like, for it. And you have a value here and you have this point. You do it again by tripling this, etc., and you basically end up with a graph that could be a straight line or might not be a straight line.
And then again, just so I know, so I get these the right way, KD is, yeah, I guess I just KD. So then you take this relationship, which you know, and you draw two similar triangles. You draw a similar triangle, which is C star, and you draw a similar triangle, which is concentration in the water, and you draw a similar triangle, which if you keep on going up here, we just label as a unit length here, and what we'll call the distribution coefficient KD. KD equals distribution coefficient. And so just by similar triangles, we could write that the concentration on the solid relative to the concentration that we put in in the liquid. Actually, this, this isn't going to change very much. These are going to be very similar to each other, and these are, this is going to be a small number. But anyway, the ratio between this and this has to be the same as the ratio between this and this, right? Just by simple, similar triangles. And that's it. This is your isotherm. It's actually called a distribution coefficient, but it's basically an isotherm, which allows you merely to be able to uh, relate the concentration that you have that's sorbed on the grains as a function of the concentration that is in the liquid. Nothing more than that. And so if you know that this concentration is one milligram per liter, then you could calculate, if you know what this parameter is, exactly what the amount that's sorbed onto the solid is. And so, if you know what's sorbed onto the solid, then you know how much is taken out of the flow regime. And of course, when you're measuring the behavior down at your compliance point, you only care about the stuff that's present in the water, right? Because that's what you're about to drink. The stuff that's been sorbed onto the, the quartz that is upstream and hasn't got to you yet, uh, you don't care about because it it's still there. You might care about it, if it gets washed off and desorbs and, and kind of juices up the stream again, but for now you don't care about that. So that's basically the idea of sorption isotherms and how they could be used. Um, let's kill this thing off uh, because I think it's uh, an important um, uh, feature. Everything we talk about is important, but this is important and relatively straightforward. So the idea is that we'd like to be able to use this in some way to be able to use exactly these expressions that we've used for conservative tracers to be able to say what the behavior is if we don't have this ideal response. And so what we'd like to do then is be able to modify these expressions in a very straightforward way. And the most straightforward way is for us to come back and take our advection dispersion equation, which happens to be an accumulation term the mechanical mixing or also molecular mixing term and advection, which are the three parts that we've looked at so far. So we've only looked at these three parts. And we could add some extra terms that represent the new behavior that we want. And so without belaboring the point, the new behavior that we could have would be changes in concentration with time due to reactions. You know, if you have two different uh, components within a, a fluid reacting with each other, the concentrations will change because A plus B might equal C, right? Because they change from one to another. And so you could imagine that even if it was static, if the, the two reactants make a new product, then the, certainly the reactants will disappear partly and the product will appear, and so their concentrations will change. But we're not talking about that, so we won't worry about that. But we are talking about sorption. And so if you look at the... Um, the dimensions of this. What are the dimensions of each of these terms? Right? They, we know they have to be the same as each other because we're adding them to each other or equating them to each other. We have to add apples to apples. So the units of this are going to be what? Concentration, typically in mass per unit um, volume. Um, and time. So in other words, mass per unit volume per unit time. And so what does this mean? Well, it means something very straightforward. The volume, of course, is our control volume, which is our part of our aquifer, which is just this little differential 
volume that we have, which is, we'll call uppercase V. And the mass of solute that's changing in it occurs over some time. And so this is just kind of a source term. If, if it, the mass goes from 1 kilogram to 1.1 kilogram, then there's a mass concentration change has to occur because that material is in the water. And by, likewise, if it goes from 1 kilogram to 900 grams, then the concentration would go down by a concomitant amount. And so these are just a source term or a sink term. And so you can think of sorption just as a source term or a sink term. It happens to be multiplied through by the uh, volumetric moisture content. So if it's saturated, um, if saturation of water is equal to 1, then this term, of course, is equal to the porosity. I guess it says that here. This is the bulk density of the aquifer. So it's something like 1,500 to 2,500 kilograms per meter cubed of that order, this range. And this is the concentration on the solid and how it changes with time. But of course, the rest of this equation is written in terms of concentrations in the liquid part. And so we want to be able to figure out exactly how we could change that around. And so the one easy way we could do to change that around is we could just multiply this by change in concentration in the liquid part with time, right? We've just multiplied this by 1. We can make this equal to some number, which we have here. And hopefully this is equal to this, right? If you put derivatives on this, and so this term here is equal to our distribution coefficient, or our isotherm. And now it's written in terms of concentration, which is the same stuff that's in here. And so by rearranging this in some way, we could, for instance, take this term over to the left-hand side. And if you do that math, which isn't very hard, you'd end up with a term which looks like this, times 1, which is this value here, obviously. And this term here is going to be what? Distribution coefficient times the bulk density divided by either the porosity or the volumetric moisture content. This is more general, I guess. And this term here equals, you know, whatever is left on the right-hand side. So longitudinal dispersion, d2 cdx squared, minus advective velocity times d cdx. So what we have is an expression where the only thing that's different from our previous expression is that this retardation factor, this whole term in brackets, is multiplying the left-hand side. And so what that means is that presumably we can use exactly the same advection dispersion equation we used before, but just by modifying it by this term. And so if we want to look at behaviors in these systems, then we can do it just by doing multiplying this equation by this. Or if we want to think about it, we can divide both sides through by, so this is, sorry, just, so this is what this new equation looks like. And so if we wanted to manipulate that, we could just divide both sides through by r, in which case this would now be just 1, right? And so what we have now is a, is a new expression. Um, it's for also for non-conservative solutes as well as conservative ones. If r is equal to 1, we get exactly the same expression we had before. Um, but now there's this multiplier, or this numerator, that acts on dispersion and advective velocity. And so you could imagine that there's some very logical outcomes that come from merely dividing our property values by this number, which is equal to 1 or larger than 1. It's always 1 or above. So r is greater than or equal to 1, I guess less than infinity. 
And so that'll be the question next time, is what are those logical behaviors that we'd expect from it? The answer's in here, of course, but, but that's how we'll start this. Okay, so we covered a, a decent amount of stuff today. So we talked about uh, conservative and began non-conservative solutions. So thanks very much. Assignment four is due here or tonight. Thank you. Thank you. And five is live. So